The following program is a presentation of Grace Communion International and Grace Communion Seminary and is made possible by generous donations from viewers like you. On this episode of You're Included, theologian Jeff McSwain explores Calvinism, Arminianism, and the Reformed view of Karl Barth. Our host is Dr. J. Michael Fazell. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. My pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. We want to talk today about Arminianism and Calvinism. It seems that either you're an Arminian or a Calvinist and uh, never the twain shall meet. Mm -hmm. What is Arminianism? What is Calvinism? What are the strengths and weaknesses and are there any alternatives? I'm glad we get to have uh, a full session to solve all these problems <laughs> about Arminian and Calvinist theology. Obviously this is something that's been debated for many, many years. Uh, I do believe that there is another option uh, even a more evangelical option than Arminianism or Calvinism. And when I say Calvinism, I mean especially uh, five-point Calvinism or what we could call Dortian theology that comes from uh, the, the Synod of Dort. Uh, and I think that that's where the tulip expression comes from that many people are familiar with. And could you rehearse that? The tulip, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. Now we could spend a whole session talking about each one of those, which we don't need to do now. But there is another type of Reformed theology aside from Dortian or five-point Calvinism. And that's the reformulated Reformed position of Karl Barth, who I feel is most consistently Reformed of, of all Calvinists. And most people don't think of Karl Barth as a Calvinist, but we can talk a little bit more about why he draws much of his, of, of his program from John Calvin. But to get back to the Arminian question, what is an Arminian? An Arminian is someone who really wants to make a place for the integrity of the human response to the gospel. They chafe under any kind of program that might have to do with predestination the kind that depersonalizes us and in a robotic, robotic or deterministic way lassos us and involuntarily brings us into heaven or into any kind of decision. A focus on freedom. A huge focus on freedom. But interestingly, I think one of the weaknesses of the Arminian program could be that there's a misunderstanding of the word freedom itself. I think most people feel like freedom is a human-centered type of freedom, more a libertarian type of freedom, where we are free to choose against God or free to choose God. In essence, that goes against the truth of how we're made, because to choose against God is actually an anti-truth move. Ergo, it's an anti-free move. It's more of an enslaved move than it is a free one. And so the whole idea of what freedom is is something that Karl Barth hammers on continually in order to show us that freedom is actually a unidirectional freedom. It's the sun who sets us free. And the spirit of truth blowing in and through our sails is what gives us the freedom to choose God. And without the Holy Spirit, Without his work in our lives, we really are not free to choose God at all. But in and of ourselves, if we try to choose God, or if we try to choose against God, we have to chalk that up to being, as I said, an anti-truth and an anti-free movement, not a free one. So in um, Five Point Calvinism, there's an effort to create a formula in which that uh, freedom is taken care of and all the all the loopholes are, are covered and the, mm -hmm. all the leaks are, uh, are filled. Right, because for a five-point Calvinist, it's very difficult to give the human agency too much potency. Uh, that's a dangerous thing to do because it allows human beings to get outside of the economy of the sovereign God and be able to make a decision that actually creates the truth 
which is something that no human being uh, should be able or really in actuality can do. Let me explain what I mean by that. To create the truth would mean to believe in a dualistic fashion that we are on one side of the ledger, unforgiven, unredeemed, and separated from God. But then, when a person decides by his human response to the gospel to believe in Jesus Christ, he moves himself, actually, from one side of the ledger to the other. So God, the God changes his, his decision and position toward him when he d makes the, the, the confession of faith. That's right. The human being is, is the, the agent who is able to make the decision to have faith in God, and by that faith, he is therefore now a forgiven child of God, now reconciled to the Lord, now redeemed, and now, rec and now no longer separated from him. All those things that weren't true before are true after the existential moment occurs, after the Jeff moment or the Mike moment, you might say. And so the before and after of the decision really changes the truth about who we are. So the, the problem there, of course, is that it puts on us the, um, the actual causing mm -hmm. of our salvation to take place. It's left to whether or not we make the decision and make it properly. That's correct. It, it's, it's really a question of ultimate truth and if there is ultimate truth. Because what that type of approach introduces is this idea of relativity that the truth is not really true about me until I decide that it is. And it's also very easy from that paradigm to pull justification by faith away from justification by grace. We know that justification by faith is a corollary to justification by grace. Justification by faith doesn't mean that I'm not justified until I have faith. It simply means that the justification that's been wrought by Jesus Christ, which is purely of grace, uh, is, is in play and is real and is true even before my own faith occurs in that moment. So uh, in, in both Arminianism and five-point Calvinism, you're, you're left with the idea that uh, you're not saved, not saved, not saved, then you make a decision for Christ and then you're saved. Mm -hmm. In both uh, concepts, even though they're coming at it supposedly from different angles, they wind up in this same position of the prayer of faith or the sinner's mm -hmm. confession or what, what do we call it? The sinner's prayer. Yeah, the sinner's prayer is the point at which the change from God doesn't love you, mm -hmm. now God does love you because mm -hmm. you did this sinner's prayer. Mm -hmm. Winds up being the linchpin in both cases. Which is ironic because in five-point Calvinism, those folks that adhere to that doctrine don't really believe that those things did occur in the existential moment. They believe that those things were established in the finished work of Christ 2,000 years ago. However, they don't want to give that away to everyone up front because they believe in limited atonement. And therefore, they have to talk more about a person's sinful condition before God as being separated from God or unreconciled to God, which is actually inconsistent with what they believe theologically, but they say that in practice when it comes to the proclamation of gospel truth in their mind. They say that because they don't really know any other way to find out who the elect are. So once they proclaim, you are a sinner, therefore repent, and then they see people that do repent. Then they can say, well, actually, you were forgiven 2,000 years ago by the cross of Christ. Actually, you were already reconciled to God and already redeemed by the finished work of Christ. But we couldn't tell you that up front because we didn't know if you were one of the elect or not. You see, the limited atonement piece is really troublesome and causes an internal conflict for the passionate five-point Calvinist evangelist because he really does want people to know Jesus Christ, but he's a little bit hamstrung because he can't get the good news out there at the beginning. He can't say, you do belong to God. You are one of the elect. You are chosen by God until that person shows some kind of movement toward God, and then he can give them the goods. He can, he can give that person the goods. The advantage of the Arminian program is that the Arminian doesn't have that problem. He can say in totally 
consistent uh, manner and in good conscience. He can stand up before a room full of people and say, Jesus Christ died for every single one of you. And if you were the only person alive in this world, as is often said, Jesus Christ loves you so much that he would have died just for you. That's something that an Arminian can say unabashedly. But the reason a Calvinist can't say that is because he doesn't believe that Christ really did die for all. I should say the reason a Calvinist can't say that in, in good conscience or that a reason a, a Calvinist can't say that in consistency with his own theology is, the, is, the limited, is because of the limited atonement part of his doctrine. And then that leaves uh, it with, with the... Um with the five-point Calvinist, it also leaves you with not being a, if you are a five-point Calvinist, how can you be totally sure that you really are among the elect because if you were among the elect, then you should be bringing forth fruit that are meat for repentance. Mm -hmm. While every time you fail in some way, then you have to kind of look over your shoulder and, and say, well, maybe I just think I'm elect and I'm going through the motions, but I'm not really like, how do I know for sure? Mm -hmm. And the only evidence that there is, is godly behavior, changed heart. Right. So it comes back down to a lack of assurance based on whether or not you're bringing forth fruit. Right. And so of course, if we're all, if we're honest with ourselves, most of the time we've got a kernel of doubt about whether we really are. And we can say, I'm sure, I'm convinced, I know I am among the elect, but there's really no way of proving it uh, beyond any, any right. shadow of a doubt. That's right, because God in his sovereignty has chosen some people from all eternity to go to hell and some people from all eternity to go to heaven. And once that idea is introduced and that Jesus Christ is really lost in the equation, in a way Jesus applies to the elect side of the ledger but it's very hard for those, but, but not to the other side. And it's very hard for those people to say, no, Jesus Christ is God. And Jesus Christ himself decided from all eternity that some people would go to hell without a chance. That was his sovereign plan. But isn't it merciful that God would allow few, a few people to be saved and to go on to heaven? Well, once that idea is introduced and we begin to read that into the character of God, we really don't know what he thinks about us at the deepest level. And so we don't know if we're really effectually called, as the terminology is used, or ineffectually called. We might actually be a wolf in sheep's clothing in that, in that paradigm. That kind of language is actually used. It is. And in fact, when a person doesn't behave the way a person who is elect is supposed to behave in line with the perseverance of the saints, many times their salvation is cast in doubt. Oh, perhaps you actually are ineffectually called. You're tasting it, but you're not really in it, and therefore you were really more predestined to go to hell than you were to go to heaven, and uh, you're disqualified, or, or maybe e even disenfranchised from the church itself that you, go, that you belong to. And that kind of thing does happen. Now, with Arminianism, uh, you're, you're not going to have a question about the nature of God as much as you do in Calvinism, and, and that's one of its greatest strengths, is that God is love toward everyone. Now, Calvinists will say that God loves everyone, but it's very difficult for him to really believe that because God really, if he, it doesn't make sense that God would love you but send you to hell without a chance. We know what love is. The Bible tells us, 1 John 3, 16, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Jesus and love and the sacrifice of the cross all go together. And you can't parse those apart and say, well, God loves everyone, but he, Jesus Christ doesn't apply to them in terms of redemption and in terms of his death on the cross. And so that's a very difficult line for a five-point Calvinist to walk. If you're really consistent as a five-point Calvinist, ultimately what you have to say is that God doesn't love everyone. He really loves those that he died for, but he doesn't love the reprobate. And in fact, he may even hate the reprobate. He loves the elect. Esau, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, is a template that's often given 
to be able to rationalize the fact that God loves some and hates others when we know from Romans 9 through 11 that that is not what Paul is trying to say. Let's talk about that. What, what is Paul's uh, point with, um, with that statement? I think it's basically, a, it, it's, it's the hyperbole of contrast. God did choose Jacob over Esau, no doubt about it. And that was important for that time in order to usher in the messianic line. We know that he chose Abraham in order to bless the whole world. And in a sense, and the beautiful thing about the big picture of all of Romans 9 through 11, is he chose Jacob to keep the messianic line intact in order to eventually save Esau as well. So God's election is not one of excluding others. It's actually meant to always include others. It's interesting in Romans 9, you know, how God's, uh, God says, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And Paul says again later in the next paragraph, God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. And it talks about what if some people are made under destruction and others for life. And so all, this word, all these words are used, but I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. And then two chapters later, we get the crescendo to it all in Romans eleven thirty two. you know, where he says, God has given all men over to disobedience that he may have mercy upon, upon all. all. Yeah. So it, it's beautiful. I will have mercy upon who I will have mercy. Well, this and is, I will this have is, mercy yeah, upon it, all. It, Who's the question a, then? Getting back to Calvinism, Arminianism, you mentioned an alternative right. in uh, Karl Barth's theology. Right. And then as that's expounded in Thomas mm -hmm. Torrance's theology, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's talk about that. Now, getting back to the Arminian strength, the strength is that the Arminians can say God loves everyone. God is love. He loves everyone. He loves everyone equally. He died for every single person. Now, the weakness, in my opinion, and of course, this is all in my opinion. I mean, uh, as theologians, we have to have humility about what we do. And there was a time in my life where I did not agree with uh with the Arminian, without, where, when I did agree, excuse me, with the Arminian way of thinking, I thought of the cross more as a hypothetical. There wasn't anything actually accomplished by the cross and, and by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I could say Jesus Christ died for every one of you, but it still wasn't true that they were forgiven or redeemed or reconciled to God until that person in the Jeff moment made that decision. And as I began to realize that and began to understand why Karl Barth wanted to move away from that, I began to realize that it's a great favor to us as human beings not to be thrown back upon ourselves in order to try to make this true or to make this real or to make this actual or effective. Is that my it, faith good enough? Did I repent properly? Right. I'm going to be going through that revolving door all of my life, just like the five-point Calvinist will be going around the revolving door of wondering what God really thinks about him. Because so you it, in both ways, you, Calvinism and Arminianism, you wind up in the same right. spot. I think Arminianism puts a lot of emphasis on do, whereas Calvinist theology puts a lot of emphasis on done. And what Karl Barth wants to always do is to take the best of those two things and to say, yes, just like the Reformed perspective says, Jesus Christ and Him crucified did affect reconciliation, redemption, forgiveness, but not just for the limited group of people out there, not in the line, along the lines of limited atonement, but for all, and the word all is used constantly throughout the New Testament to talk about what Christ did for all. So one thing that the Arminian hasn't done is hasn't give, given due credence to the past tense language of the New Testament that these things have been accomplished in the finished work of Christ. Karl Barth wants to say, yes, they have been accomplished. They're not hypotheticals. They're not true if you make a decision. They have been accomplished. They are actual, they are real. And yet, this is not in a deterministic way that makes a person a robot. Because God's inmost being is about love, because God is love, one may resist the Holy Spirit, grieve the Holy Spirit, and go against the reality of who Jesus Christ is and who He is in Christ. It's interesting, this is thrown uh, right out there for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 starts out, the love of Christ compels us because we are convinced that one has died for all. Therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live may live not for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Here we have Jesus Christ died for all. Here we have the fact that when he died, everybody died. And we know from Scripture, from that, this passage and from others like 1 Corinthians 13 
and from Romans 6, that you have to keep the unity of Christ's death and resurrection together. Those who died with Christ rose with Christ. And in Adam all die and Christ all will be made alive. This is the, this is the, this is the fabric of the work of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying it's not a question of whether everybody died and rose with Christ. The question is, are you going to live for yourself? Or are you going to live for him who for your sake died and was raised? So there's an objective truth, but there's a subjective participation in the objective truth. And then he goes on to say, we no longer therefore look at anyone from a human point of view. We used to look at Christ that way, but from now on we don't. And anyone is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It doesn't say you could become a new creation if you make a decision. He is saying that because Jesus Christ has come and died and rose again, there is a new creation. Everyone is a new creation. We no longer look at anyone from a worldly point of view. So he goes on then to say, and God has given us this ministry of reconciliation. God was reconciling, God has reconciled the world to himself. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and giving to us this ministry of reconciliation. We beseech you on behalf of God, be reconciled to God. And then he, he ends up with this, do not receive the grace of our God in vain. Today's the day of salvation. It's here. That dimension is here and you are in that dimension. Do not buck that. Do not kick against it. Do not fight against it. Be reconciled to God because you are. This puts the subject of participation together with the object of truth. You have been reconciled to God. You have been forgiven. And the whole world has been reconciled to God and forgiven by Jesus Christ. So if you reject that, you're not rejecting an opportunity. You're not rejecting a possibility. Right. You're rejecting the truth of what already is. That's right. And in that passage, it shows how one might reject those things. It gives the objective truth and it gives you an opportunity to not receive the grace of the Lord in vain. That would be a subjective refusal, which is possible. It's not a deterministic robotic system. It is possible to receive the grace of God in vain, even though you've been included in the death and resurrection of so Christ. The point is that you have received it. You can either receive it to good or you can receive it in vain. You've been given this relationship. It's, it, you've been turned, you were turned away from God in your sin and rebellion against him. God has come. He has assumed your sinful fallen nature in Jesus Christ, and he has turned you back around and reconciled you to God. And what that means is you've been given a face-to-face -face relationship with God in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. You are a part of this relationship. This is what reconciliation is. Therefore, as a person who's included in that, you may submit to it or you may fight against it. The subjective participation is to believe not only that you're included in this, but every person in the world's included. This gets past the limited atonement problem. If I don't know everybody's been included in this, I'm not really sure if I have been included exactly. in it. Exactly. Because that goes back to if just a few people are included, how do I know if I'm on the right side or the left side of the ledger? But if I, to the extent that I know this includes everyone, I'll be assured that it includes me too. But to the extent that I think it includes some people, I'll be concerned and, and worried about that, and my assurance will be virtually nil, or it will go through this revolving door syndrome. The assurance is there because I believe this happened for all people, that Christ not only did something for us, but he did something with us. Now, here is the point that a lot of people get to, and they then, as Calvinists, and they really struggle with Bart's program. Because it sounds like if Christ has not only done something for us, but he's done something with us, then it, it sounds to me like uh, I still have to make a decision about whether or not I'm going to participate or not. And that decision is really back to an Arminian decision. It's really back to this question of, well, there's a new line in the sand. The sand, line in the sand is not whether I'm forgiven or not forgiven anymore. It's not whether I'm reconciled to God or not reconciled to God anymore. It's whether I believe in that or whether I don't believe in that prior truth. And that still feels like an Arminian problem to a Calvinist because he's like, well, it's still thrown back on you because now you've got to believe it. You're the one that's got to believe it or not. And an Arminian can buy into the BART program and really relish it 
with great intensity, and I know a lot of Arminians who have done that, because they feel like it still gives that place for a subjective decision. Do I believe or do I not believe? And they can decide, okay, all this stuff is true. There's one truth. It's not relative to whether I believe it or not. That's very refreshing. It's all been done by Jesus Christ. Now, for me, my free decision is related to whether I believe in it or not. An Arminian can stay right there, and that's great for you who are Calvinists and, and realize, well, wait a minute, that's not good enough for me because that belief still feels like it's up to me. That belief still feels like that's the critical moment in which all this stuff then becomes true for me and lets me go to heaven. And I would say that that's a great place to be. I think everyone who's a Calvinist who wants to give the first and last word to God needs to go through this strait of, of wrestling with that question. Because then it, it does still seem to exalt the do over the done. But what Bart wants to do is always keep the do inside the done. He would say the epitome of anthropocentrism, the, 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 hum, the, the, the epitome of humanism, would be for us to objectify God and to say from a distance, okay, this is the situation now, as I just described it a minute ago, and now I'm going to decide if I believe it or not. Bart would essentially say Arminianism at the end of the day is humanistic. He would essentially say that Calvinists are right in that it's not good enough just to stop there. He would essentially say that it lands us at a place of semi-Pelagianism where belief actually does become a work. Bart will never do that, but how does he keep the do inside of the done? He does that by using the word be. As he says in this passage, Paul says in this passage, You've been reconciled to God, therefore we beseech you be reconciled to God. This is not universalism. Universalism is way too easy. If God wanted, wanted universalism to be the case, he never would have gone through the trouble of the cross and of all human suffering. He could have just said, I love you guys so much you're all going to go to heaven. Universalism is way too easy. It's very linear and very simple. But in this passage, Carl, Carl Bart realizes the Apostle Paul is a passionate evangelist. He's not just some couch potato who thinks, well, God's going to bring everybody into heaven. He said, I've got to get this message out there, guys. The love of Christ compels us. We beseech you on behalf of God. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God because you are. Not because you're not, but because you are. This keeps the do inside the done. And it essentially says, even Christ is the one who believes that you are reconciled to God. So instead of standing out here aloof and, and, and actually looking at this whole situation of reconciliation as if it's in your laboratory and you as the almighty human being get to make a decision about this, we have to say, no, part of reconciliation is that Jesus Christ does everything from the human side. There is not one modicum of, uh, of our independent humanity that can make a decision outside of God. We all live and move and have our being in Him. So even our believing is a participatory event. So grace includes the human response, Bart would say. And in doing that, he's able to say this. He's able to say, Jesus Christ does it all, even your believing. And even your believing in Jesus Christ does it all, even in your believing. And even your believing in your believing in your believing that Jesus Christ does it all, even your believing. And even your believing in your believing in your believing in your believing that Jesus Christ ad infinitum. You can never get outside of these brackets of grace where God has represented in Christ, Jesus Christ has represented God to humanity and everything about humanity to God. You can't get outside and quantify that uh, and, and exalt your subject self as being the one who gets to decide about God. Instead of fighting to get ourselves outside of that equation, just recognize you're inside of it. Don't fight that. You are inside. Submit to the ad infinitum. You can never get to a place where you pull your belief outside of what God has done and what God is doing to make a decision about it as if you are quantifying God. That is actually religion. Instead, Jesus Christ has, has made this decision, and your decision is really more of a non-decision. <laughs> your decision is really more 
the action step is really a non-action step. It, it's, it's important, it's critical, but it's actually to submit to the ad infinitum of saying, my decision is not that important anymore. My decision is secondary to the, to the decision that God has made for me in Jesus Christ. That God has said yes to me and he said yes for me in Christ. And I might submit to that ad infinitum and say, I don't have to worry so much. My decision is really, I don't have to worry about my decision because I know Jesus Christ has done it all. That is amazingly freeing, Mike, once that penny drops, because it still makes decision important, but it wraps it all up into the done and what is being done of Jesus Christ as our representative high priest who takes everything from the human side, represents us to God, and therefore keeps the covenant of grace from both sides. We're caught up in that. Why fight to get outside of it? Why not just repose? on that dynamic of Trinitarian life that we've been given. So again, I think the whole point about decision, sometimes we make too big a deal out of that. And, and the reason is because we're rooted in humanism. And we often go back to this verse, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? What must I do? We, we are so wrapped up in that. And well, what Paul says to the Philippian jailer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Not, you'll be saved if you believe in Jesus Christ. He's actually telling the jailer, Jesus Christ has got you. He's carrying you. Just as best as you're able, surrender to that. Knowing that you can never really surrender as an independent person, but only as someone in participation with the surrender that Jesus Christ has made to God on your behalf. I like that word. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's like Jesus Christ is the foundation for every human action to God. And we can never get off that foundation. We can pretend that we are and build on the sand, but we can never really get off that foundation and offer God anything as an independent agent. That agency question is big for Calvinists and for Arminians alike. And it's usually the last thing to go. Our agency, our human agency, is usually the last thing to go because we're so keen to self-justify we're so keen to make it happen. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And I think Jesus is trying to get something through to us when he says, hey guys, if you want to find your life, you've got to lose it. And when you lose your agency, you lose your claimed individual decision-making and making it happen, you get back your personhood. And you get back your share in the Trinitarian person's and that great dance that's going on between Father, Son, and Spirit. Who, if they knew, would want to hold on to their individuality and be wrapped up in themselves, which is a very small package, if they really heard the gospel with ears to hear and could lose their individualism to become a person? The real person that you already are. The person that you are. That without you without are. losing your own identity. You don't become a drop in the cosmic sea where you become less personalized. It's just the opposite in Jesus Christ. The more Jesus means the more of us, not the less. And that's why T.F. Torrance calls him the personalizing person. So anytime we get into theologies that want to take us down a depersonalizing route, we know we're, we're going the wrong direction. Anytime we go down at the, uh, the road of a theology that wants to take us to a humanistic route that is elevating the human subject self, outside of that of Jesus Christ, we need to be careful. Karl Barth gives us a way to move between those two, to keep the do within the done, and to be what we are by the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You've been watching You're Included, a production of Grace Communion International.